Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. I'm Mason Voth. That is Derek Young, both of us members of K-State Online, part of the On3 Network, as we continue our season-long coverage of the Cats, and they come off a dominant 45 to nothing win over SEMO. You've gotten the recap shows in multiple different ways now, whether it's through 3Maw, through the Sunday show with myself, Drew, and KSU fan, or Monday, D and I, a quick little recap going over our over and unders, keeping ourselves honest with uh, what we did and didn't cor- correctly predict. And uh, now we get to dive into uh, some of the middle of the week stuff that is always a, a topic of conversation. And that will include Chris Kleiman's comments from Tuesday, kind of setting the stage. I think he's been pretty transparent this year in the way that he's handled uh, a lot of the questions that have come his way. And that's, you know, important, especially when it comes down to the fact that two of the biggest things that we've been concerned or worried about and and discussed a lot with him are injuries, which people always want to know more about injury situations and the backup quarterback stuff. And I feel like on both of those fronts, he's been pretty open and honest about all of those. But before we dive into uh, Chris Kleiman's words on Tuesday, we'll take a quick peek at the top 25 because the Wildcats are still a ranked team after their win last week. They moved up only one spot from 16 to 15. And uh, my, my little note on this is that now that an in-season ranking has come out, Chris Kleiman has had the Wildcats ranked in season for each of his first five years in Manhattan. Obviously, 2020 did not end in the most positive note. And I think in 2021, uh, the ranking disappeared just as quickly as it appeared. But nonetheless, that is an impressive mark to hit. Uh, what, what does that say to you, D.Y., about what Chris Kleiman has been able to do at K-State? The fact that he and all five seasons has found a way at different times to have the Wildcats in the top 25. It means he sustained what was built prior to his arrival. And then he kind of probably hit the wall. That was a product of why they needed a change at the end. And that's probably why he faced some of that adversity in 2020. And then he was able to build it more into his vision and his vision resulted in a big 12 championship. So um, just, I think it was the evolution of a program. He was able to sustain with the current roster, but then it got to the point where we were expecting it to get, where it was going to kind of unfold on them a little bit, but he was able to recover based on the way that he can build a program in in a culture. And then obviously now it's about sustaining what he has built rather than the person before him. And that will take consistency and we'll see – if they are able to do that, what life looks after you've, you know, reached the the peak of the mountain, so to speak, with the Big Twelve championship from a year ago. Yeah, and I think we, I I feel like we kind of realized that when Chris Kleiman was hired, that he was going to be the right fit. Pretty much from the get go, when he he spoke for the first time, you realized, okay, he's going to be the right blend of what people have come to expect K State to be, but also add enough of kind of a new age and his own spin on it to keep things progressing to where K-State can remain competitive and have a chance to win conference titles in a year like 2022. Because, you know, in all honesty, Bill Snyder had his winning, his serious winning days were well behind him at that point because I just don't know that he was going to be able to keep up, even in the way that college football was in like 2018, 2019. Imagine Bill Snyder having to try and navigate NIL and like heavy transfers now. Like (laughs) that would not be the the easiest thing. And that's not his fault, you know, to to many extents. It's just the product of how the game has gone on. And it's just like anything else in life. People, you're gonna get phased out of something. Like I find myself now, and I thought that I would never be the guy that, you know, didn't understand something like a trend or uh, you know, how to operate something. But I find myself now with certain things that my 18-year-old brother that's a freshman at K-State, he knows about and understands, and I'm confused as heck about it. And I'm, you know, I, I'm only 25. I thought I would be able to do that. So I think Chris Kleiman has done a, a great job. And, you know, the, the top 25 thing, it's not like a major note, but it is significant enough. And I think it just kind of is another one of those um little numbers and stats that just kind of goes to show that what Chris Kleiman is doing and has done at K-State is the right thing and is putting them in a really good position moving forward. To your point, imagine me at 34 years old. Like, I, I, I'll i use this as an example. I don't get the TikTok stuff. Can't do it. 
Yeah. Um, I, I bet if you look through like my for you page on TikTok, it would not be like the traditional TikTok. Minor, it's like you, I think you can upload three minute videos as the max on TikTok. I'm probably watching a lot of those. Like I follow some middle aged man that like cooks and grills at his house. And then uh, I follow a guy that he does sandwiches of history every single day. He's, he's uploading a different sandwich he makes. That's the kind of thing I follow on TikTok. I don't get some of the other stuff. Uh, some of the the cool guy trends that are out there. So I get it. Like, it's just, you know, it's an easy way to consume videos, but I don't get it to the extent that uh, probably the Shane Porters of the world get it. You know, like the the TikTok dances and trying to get viral um, songs and stuff like that. I mean, uh, on the flip side, if you want to know, like, where my alley or my wheelhouse is, I, I... don't have the TikTok app at all. And and within the last year, I even removed the Instagram app. So I, oh. I got one and, and I don't do Facebook and I haven't done Facebook probably in five to six years. So I'm going on a tangent here, but I'm a very one social media uh, platform kind of guy. I can't really expand. I don't have the bandwidth to do that, nor the attention span, nor the desire. There's a lot that goes into it. So, uh, it's now X, but formerly known as Twitter. It's the, really the only one that I am um, readily available on and put my attention to. So hopefully that is one that sustains over time because I don't uh, – yeah, I'm getting old. I, I don't want to change my routine. Uh, yeah, you know, like uh, I, I, my Instagram, I'm not good at it. I, I will uh, easily admit that. I'm, I, I only post pictures of stadiums and like – my dog and now my daughter, and I'm sure nobody really cares about that. But uh, Chris Kleiman, he he uh, he probably doesn't get some of that stuff. But what he does get is he what he has to get, and he's he surrounded himself with enough people that do get that stuff uh, and can and can yeah. play along to uh, get the the right type of guys in to kind of continue uh, what K State has had going. But top twenty five, number fifteen in the country, really not a bad spot to be right now. You know, I, I could have made a case for them to move up a little bit more, but also you played SEMO and you look at the 14 teams ahead of them. You'd probably say on paper those teams are better than K-State uh, and we'll just have to let the season play out for K-State to prove that they are better than those teams when it comes to, you know, kind of proving what you can do on the field. Yeah, if you start them at 16, after one week 15 seems appropriate when you play an FCS opponent. Yeah. So, you know, they, they they fared better than some other schools did uh, in the top 25 this past oh, week. Were, oh, oh, they weren't in the top 25. But. Well, yeah, but that was uh, – that's worth mentioning how, how bad they were. And there, I will say there are some other teams in the Big 12 that somehow still got votes. Texas Tech got a vote still. Iowa State got a vote. They won, but they got a Her, vote. They, by the way – it's very weird, uh, the Iowa State story. And I want to touch on Iowa State and Houston. But Iowa State traditionally struggles with Northern Iowa. So after the most tumultuous offseason, yep. they finally handled Northern Iowa the way they're supposed to after their most tumultuous offseason. So go figure. And Houston, most impressive win in the Big 12. I mean, shout out to the Cougs. Daniel yep. Holgerson and that Red Bull ready to fire on all cylinders. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. Houston had the most impressive win of the week. And yeah, it, it some of it doesn't add up what happened and, and how it went. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see kind of what, what comes out of it. And I think honestly, like you look around at what the, uh, the Big 12 has going on this weekend, there are some good games for us to kind of get a vibe check on what's happening. Like Iowa State is one of them where I'm with you. I, I was kind of impressed that they beat Northern Iowa 30 to nine. Now I don't think you and I is as good as they've been in past years when they've played. Um, but Iowa state to take care of business in a game that historically is very close. Um, that impressed me. And now they get Iowa who obviously is a gettable team. It's a home game for Iowa state. So they could probably do it. And another team that I'm interested in that, you know, I don't think played great this weekend, but Oklahoma state goes on the road to Arizona state and those are kind of two teams that I think are on like the same level right now. And they're power five teams that didn't look very good against group of five opponents. And that could be a really ugly game to watch, but it could be so ugly. It's fun. So I think there yeah. are a lot of games this week in the big 12 where teams can kind of prove themselves. And for a team like Texas tech, they can bounce back in a major way by getting to play Oregon at home. Yeah. Oklahoma state, Arizona state, 
that has the potential to be a power five sicko game. And, and quite yes. frankly, even though it's a road game, I believe for the pokes, mm -hmm. they should win that game because Arizona state's kind of a dumpster fire. Like I think Kenny Dillingham might be a good coach. I think Jaden Rashad is probably going to be a good quarterback, but it's early for those two. And they were dealt, you know, the, the worst of worst situations because they have a terrible administration. You're dealing with the Herm Edwards fallout, and now you're not even playing for a bull this year. So yeah. not a great situation in Tempe. You know, two other teams, and we'll just finish this around the Big 12 mm -hmm. water cooler kind of thing we got going on here, is that BYU, quietly a very bad week. They yes. beat Sam Houston 14-0. to zero. Um, That's not impressive. And West Virginia. Look, I'm not, I wasn't expecting West Virginia to be good this year. I think this is probably going to be the last rendition of Neil Brown and Morgantown, but they typically are competitive. And I know it was a late score at the end of the game, which is was a little questionable. And now James Franklin and Neil Brown are jockeying back and forth in the media about it. But I guess I thought West Virginia could keep it somewhat close. I mean, that game was really never in you know jeopardy for the for the Navy Lions. Now they're supposed to be good, but West Virginia typically just hasn't got blown out handily by Neil Brown with Neil Brown uh, as head coach. Oh, it's funny. See, I, I actually came away from the West Virginia uh, game and thought to myself, Hey, you know what? They play, they, they kept it closer than I thought they might. I thought Penn state might just absolutely wreck them and tear them apart. So I, I give West Virginia a little bit of props, but you're right. It was never really competitive. And TCU, might be, a fraud. And TCU might be a fraud. Yeah, TCU, that's one of those that's purely like they were in the national championship last year, and now people think that, hey, they're going to be set for a while with Sonny Dykes and everything that goes on there. I think what we've seen is that they are probably a team that there's going to be a big dip this year, and then they're going to have to kind of hit that rise back from the benefits of playing in the national championship game because – they lost so much from last year's team that were serious contributors for them. Obviously, Max Duggan's gone. Quentin Johnson's gone. Kendra Miller on the offense is gone. And the offense really wasn't the problem for them. The offense eventually found its way. Now, the little note that I saw, Chandler Morris threw two red zone interceptions uh, in the first week against Colorado. Max Duggan only threw one last year. I'm sure you can remember uh, which one that was. Uh, that, was that the Julius Brents one? That yeah. was Julius Brents in Arlington. Yes, that just the perfect little flutter ball into Julius Brents's arm. So, but it's the defense that was really bad, and th their linebacker Johnny Hodges said yesterday in their <laughs> media availability, "We're the laughing stock of college football right now," and he's not wrong. Like, and I I would defend them on the Georgia side of it because th that's unfair to laugh at them for the Georgia game because they were they were the guinea pig against Georgia yes. because. Every program in college football besides two, besides three, would have had a similar fate. Yes, exactly. That's That was kind of my thing where I was like, okay, I, I like I can defend them in that circumstance. But, yeah, the Colorado thing, it looks really bad for them. And there's not, you know, a whole lot that uh, they can do to redeem themselves. So uh, it'll be interesting. And the one, my one last note, um, I didn't expect us to talk Big 12 as much, but – Sometimes that's the way these yeah. things go. And I'll say with Oklahoma, obviously they won 73 to zero over uh, Arkansas State, which might give Kansas State fans a little PTSD. 73 to zero. Yeah, it looks good, but it, it, you consider the opponent. And the funny thing is with Oklahoma, here's what I'm going to say we won't know until October 7th because their schedule is so much of a joke. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what I, I, I said that exactly. People will see it uh, whenever you're reading it today, uh, our, our big 12 power rankings, but that's exactly what I said in there was Oklahoma did this last year in their non-con. They blew out three, you know, mediocre teams, all those wins by 30 plus points. Now, none of them were, you know, in the seventies, like they did against Arkansas state, but then they got into Big 12 play. They were 3-0, and and they ended up losing seven of their last ten games last season. And we'll see. It, like you said, it's not until they play Texas the first weekend in October that we're going to yeah. get kind of a feel for Oklahoma. So we'll see. The Sooners, one of only three Big 12 teams ranked this week at 18. Texas, the other one, at 11. So uh, the Big 12 is represented, but not as heavily as it could be 
Uh, and, and it's starting to look like this could be a little bit of a down year for the Big 12 after I thought, you know, they gained quite a bit of respect last year in the last few seasons before. Potentially. Uh, and before Oklahoma sees Texas on that first weekend in October, it's he just got done with Arkansas State. It's SMU, Tulsa, Cincinnati, Iowa State. Yeah, not not the most daunting of schedules, I would say. Uh-huh. Uh We'll, uh, we'll move on. We'll dive into what Chris Kleiman had to say now to help us preview the week coming up with Troy a little bit better. And we'll start in the, the spot that's probably most significant for what we'll see on the field this weekend, and that would be the injury situation. It's important to note that uh, Chris Kleiman was pretty transparent about most of them and how they went down. Uh, I think that they seem unsure about how they, they're going to handle the Keegan Johnson thing. That's probably just a wait and see as they, they get closer to game day. Uh, basically, Chris Kleiman laid it out as, you know, it, it came off as, hey, if we can get him in for a handful of snaps, uh, we've compared it to like the Uso situation last week. He got 11 snaps, looked good in him, was productive, got him out. He's healthy. Let him keep getting healthier. Same type of deal for Keegan Johnson probably would be nice for K-State. And then the other injury situations that we got updates on, uh, Jake Clifton at linebacker. And we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more because that was one of those moments where I thought Chris Klein was pretty transparent. And then he gave us – he kind of snuck it in there talking about the offensive line and everything, but kind of let us know that John Pastore is going to be back in practice this week. Doesn't know if he's available for the game yet, but that's certainly something that could help this K-State offensive line that – was underwhelming for what they were they were built to be in the offseason in game number one. So that's the, the lay of the land with the injury situation. We can uh, start on the, the Keegan Johnson side of it and, and where you see that playing out and also why it might be important for him to see the field this week as opposed to his first time in purple being on the road in Columbia next weekend. Yeah, with Keegan Johnson, it, it sounds like it's uh, not no determination or conclusion made – for, for the Saturday's contest yet, still a week-to-week thing. He was scratched pretty late in the week last week, and that's why he wasn't on the field or in uniform on Saturday. We'll see what it looks like this week. I, you know, It's probably just going to be based on how he's felt throughout the week and how much he's able to do at practice and what he wakes up and feels like on Saturday, to be quite honest. And it's one of those things that's like, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's something that is probably there, and if forced – a push came to shove, he's probably able to play. But it sounds like a, per, a precautionary deal. Hopefully it's not a precautionary deal throughout the year. But I just don't think they want to see it turn into what the situation became at Iowa, and that's why they're hedging their bets a little bit, I think, by you know being careful with them at this point in the season. But, you know, we'll, we'll know more, you would think, in a few days, maybe on Saturday. Uh, but like you said, I think there's – some level of importance to getting your feet wet prior to what would many are going to consider a major contest against Missouri. Uh, And I, yeah, it would be great. It would be very ideal for Kansas state. If Keegan Johnson can get over this hurdle, uh, remove the necessity to build in precautionary measures and be able to see 10 to 15 snaps on Saturday against Troy. So he's kind of familiarized with the pace, the system, uh, how things work at Kansas State on a game day prior to what will be a more significant matchup when they play Missouri and Columbia the following week. Yep, uh, that's, I mean, exactly how I see it for him. It, it, just get him out there a little bit if he can this week. Obviously, don't push it if you don't need to because, as you mentioned, the, the health thing was a concern while he was at Iowa. It's not exciting to see that uh, he's starting his time at K-State having to kind of nurse something and and be cautious about it moving forward. All right, moving on, another injury situation that we got an update on. Jake Clifton went down in the opener, and it was, you know, in the middle of – he also got a lot of praise yesterday from Chris Kleiman, tossed in there. Um, Chris Kleiman was giving some some well-deserved kudos to Cooper Beebe about his ability to basically be an all-Big 12 player at any position on the offensive line that they needed him at, and then mentioned, hey – it's kind of the same thing that Jake Clifton can do for us, playing at either the Will, Sam, or Mike, just how versatile these guys are. But Jake Clifton got injured in game number one against SEMO. And based off the way Chris Kleiman talked about it, he said doubtful about Clifton this weekend. And 
I, I've said it to you before, the vibe that I get when coaches are that transparent about this early in the process saying doubtful, it's likely that we're not going to see Jake Clifton. Actually, I would I would bet on not seeing Jake Clifton this weekend. How did you read into Chris Kleiman's comments? And then and what, what does that mean for K-State moving forward without Jake Clifton if they don't have him this weekend or for an extended period of time? Yeah, if Jake Clifton were to play this week, it would be a remarkable recovery based on everything that we, that we know. Um, and so, I, would, you know, Chris Kleiman's basically calling him out for at least one game. I imagine it's multiple. Again, not a long-term situation, and I, I would – be surprised if he plays a non, another non-conference game this season. We'll put it that way. Uh, other than that, it's probably up in the air just a little bit and depends on, on how quickly he can heal and what it looks like, you know, a week from now, two weeks from now, and we'll go from there. I think it's kind of a loss uh, just because if, if you put these coaches up to a lie detector test, I think there's a solid shot that Jay Clifton in, one, in some shape, way, or form is probably the primary backup off the bench regardless of what happens – at any of the three linebacker spots. So his value is pretty uh, high level, uh, great quality because of that. And they don't have that Swiss Army knife that they can go to. I think they almost just consider him a fourth starting linebacker at this point, just like King Garber is a third starting quarterback for them at this point. Maybe Jane, excuse me, Jane Jackson's a fourth starting wide receiver for them at this point. Uh, Treshawn Ward's like a second starting running back for them. They, they have quality depth. Uh, but when you take out one of those and, and Jay Clifton, then you're probably relying on more true freshmen than anything because it really does seem like guys like Asa Newsom, Terry Kirk, or Asa Newsom, Austin Romain are ahead of the junior college guys like Terry Kirksey and Rex Van Y. So um, without Jay Clifton, you'll probably see more Asa Newsom at the will spot, I would think. And reasonably, you'd probably expect more Austin Romain at the mic spot behind Daniel Green. Austin Romain got pretty good run in the game on Saturday. And, you know, the, the way that you can kind of just baseline tell, I think, how somebody's doing is how often, especially at a, you know, at a position where it's not like quarterback or running back where you always notice those guys. But Austin Romain, just every time I kind of looked up, it was like, oh, hey, there's 45 out there making a play or being around the ball, you know? Yeah, I think he was the first true freshman that got in the game, actually. Um at least from an offense or defensive mm -hmm. standpoint. And I think he was on one of the first special teams units. He him, was. Him, I'm going to say him, Jack Fabris, and Issa Newsom. Mm -hmm. So those three are probably, regardless of injury, I think we're going to be counted on just about every game. Yeah, and and all three of them did some things that, that made it worth their time in game number one. The other injury update that kind of got snuck in there on us, John Pastore, offensive lineman for the Wildcats. Chris Kleiman made note that he was going to be back at practice this week. Didn't know about his availability for the game. Uh, what what would it mean for K-State to be able to get him back whenever it is this season to be able to plug him into the offensive line as it currently stands where obviously you know they're missing Christian Duffy right now and there might be some more question marks about the offensive line after week number one. Yeah, his availability this week will be dependent on how quickly he can ramp up and get back into action because I think he missed multiple weeks so it's a little bit about getting back up to speed, probably getting in the right conditioning um, spot of, to be able to help the team. I'm, I don't know if they can get them up to that level that quickly. So um, questionable at best in terms of if he's actually able to provide snaps this week. But in an ideal situation, if he had not had the setback that he did during training camp, I think there's a good chance that you know he at least – makes it a battle at right tackle, perhaps wins it against Carver Willis. So John Pastore was going to, I think, play a central role at, at some point this season, at least in the early goings with in the absence of Christian Duffy, um, whether or not he can climb back to that spot he was at prior to injury. That'll just depend on what he does uh, in the next few weeks. So uh, underrated injury probably that we didn't spotlight enough just because of what he could have added um, without Christian Duffy, but it might be too late for that. Once he's ready to go, maybe Christian Duffy's back in, in the starting spot too. Yeah, well, and John Pasori, a guy that certainly looks the part on the offensive line. So uh, I think he kind of looks like the mountain from uh, Game of Thrones. I yes, kinda... yes. Uh, and it would just be, you know, it, it's just good for them to have other guys in the mix to see uh, how they can plug and play, especially if you're you're down a starter like Christian Duffy right now. Moving on to uh, a very exciting topic for a lot of people. Avery Johnson gave the Wildcats quite a bit to, uh, 
to look at on Saturday and the the handful of series that he was out there. It seems like from just, you know, reading the tea leaves, Avery Johnson is the number two quarterback on this team. And Chris Kleiman kind of addressed it some more yesterday. He got a couple of questions about it. And, you know, the one that I thought he gave the most telling answer, again, was one question that I thought was going to be kind of repetitive from Saturday. But Chris Kleiman just kind of keeps giving, you know, little bits of information that add a little bit more to the picture and uh, it becomes a little bit more clearer. But does it seem like to you that even though Chris Kleiman's trying to play this like, a, hey, you know, both guys, it's still the or situation. Does it seem like you, Avery Johnson's the backup quarterback now? I feel that way for the most part. Uh, and some of the comments, like talking about, you know, the injury a little bit that Jake Rubley had suffered and, and both getting, you know, those snaps in practice, which is probably true. It just feels like a little bit applying cover, uh, I would say, if, if that's accurate or not. Just to Jake Rubley, I think being sensitive to the situation and what, you know, he's kind of having how he's having to maneuver and handle this himself, which is probably not an easy thing for him to do. And I you know applaud to Jake Rubley for for what Avery Johnson even admitted, taking a very active role and an active part in helping Avery Johnson prepare last week to play, knowing that Avery would would definitely be playing. So he's being very mature and handling it uh, correctly. Um and admirably, I might add, in, in what was honestly probably a pretty tough situation for him, um, maybe a little disappointing for him. Everyone wants to play. Everyone wants to be higher on the depth chart than what they truly are. So uh, kudos to him for doing that. At the end of the day, I agree. Now, the only thing is, is like if it gets like tough or pretty tight in terms of a window of a potential redshirt still being available, I think they might lean that way because he even mentioned – you know, it being a similar situation to Will Howard last year where, you know, in an ideal situation, maybe you would love to redshirt him, but who knows what happens, right? Uh, a lot of things can happen that maybe dictate or mandate what your approach will be. But, you know, hearing Colin Klein, Chris Kleiman repeatedly say, we wanted to get him snaps. We wanted to get him extended action to be able to evaluate him because we have to get him ready to play tells me that, if push comes to show and they need a backup quarterback, it's going to be Avery Johnson because that's the one that they're getting ready to play. Yeah, and and the part about that you brought up there about comparing it to Will Howard, Chris Kleiman directly mentioning the situation at TCU last year and how that had to play out with Will Howard. I think that like that's the part that triggered to me. Okay, we've seen this trend kind of happening. We feel like they're saying Avery Johnson is probably the number two without saying he's the number two. And that was the one that in my head and in my mind, like it's made up. Avery Johnson is the number two quarterback on this team right now. But that doesn't mean that because I could see it playing out like this. They're up big on Troy this weekend and it, we don't see Avery Johnson this week. We could see Jake Rubley because if you remember back to last year, Will Howard did not play in the FCS game against South Dakota. They, they ended up just going, I think, straight to Jake Rubley because – you know, they were going to try and preserve as much of that red shirt as they could for Will Howard. Now, the reason why Chris Kleiman would bring, would bring some of this up and why it's important to him is because outside of his first year at K-State, when Skylar Thompson started all 13 games, they have had to turn to a backup quarterback for extended periods uh, in, in full games and longer times since he's been at K-State. So even though you would knock on wood and hope that that's not going to happen this year because you're due for some good injury luck at the position – uh, Chris Kleiman knows now at this point that he has to bank on having a guy ready to go and ready to step up. And fortunately for them, that's what they had in Will Howard last year, and he could keep them on their trajectory to the Big 12 title. But that's because Will Howard had two full seasons of failure before that and, and game reps that he could kind of learn off of. And Avery Johnson or even Jake Rubley, whoever it ultimately ends up being, if Will Howard were to go down, they're going to have way less experience than what Howard did. So as much as they can get now is probably important, but uh, it does but, seem like Avery Johnson's the guy. Yeah, in terms of deal handling it the way that they handled Will Howard last year, I mean, that would be the difference, right? Like they didn't have to – if Will, if that was last year's situation right now, they wouldn't have to play Will Howard against um, Simo or Troy because he's they didn't have to get him ready to play. Mm -hmm. He – they already had him ready to play. The difference this year 
is it's the same situation, but they still have to get Avery Johnson those live reps to get him ready to play. So while last year they didn't have to play Will Howard um, in that Tulane game, I think it was, they might have to play Avery Johnson against Troy. And that's not saying like, oh, you know, they have a gun to their head and this is what they must do. But if they're adamant and what they're saying is true, they have to get them ready to play and more possessions, more snaps. That's probably the requirement at this point. Well, and also you think about it like people should just be realistic about the situation. If Avery Johnson is as good as fans want him to be and expect him to be and as good as Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein have talked him up as right now, Avery Johnson staying at K-State for five years is a very unlikely outcome, you know, in, in, in all things considered. So if four, – Four is the most likely outcome. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, having that red shirt kept isn't the most important thing in the world, but obviously if they get through the season clean and can keep it, they would love to do that and yeah. we'll, we'll see it's what one the, it's one of the yeah, It's one of those things where, like, um, it probably – isn't a drop dead thing that they have to protect, but if they get towards the end of the season and it plays out to the fact that he's at three or four games, it's like, Oh, we might as well retro him now because you don't want what you don't want to do. I think it's what happened to will once and why he wanted to keep the redshirt last year is to play in five games. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's, you know, it used to be like in terms of the red shirt before the new rules were in place, like don't put someone in for three plays and have a burden of red shirt that way, which is kind of yeah. what basketball is. Now it's like, don't play anybody five games. Like that does yep. no good for anyone. Yep. No, exactly. Well, which is, well, that's exactly what happened to Will in 2021, yep. right? The Texas game was the fifth. Yeah. So yeah. and he bit the bullet. I mean, mm-hmm. that's why like hats off to Will Howard for the way that he's crafted his career at Kansas state and handled it with the utmost maturity. Because really, I mean, it worked itself out into where, you know, it's not really going to negatively impact anything. But the Texas game in 2021, I mean, that, that was unfortunate for him to have a five games and you not redshirt. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Well, we've got a couple more serious topics left, then we'll end it with a, a pretty good kicker at the end. But speaking of kickers, uh, real quick, Chris Tennant, your guy, uh, yeah, no I my do. guy curse here for Derek Young because – he was high on Chris Tennant coming into the year. He proved himself to some extent, was perfect on his PATs, hit the 51-yard field goal. And Chris Kleiman, I thought this was just interesting. It's not like it's earth-shattering stuff, but just to kind of hear how they're managing Chris Tennant now and saying, hey, it's kind of about managing how many times he's having to kick the football during the week. We've kind of got him on a pitch count right now. I thought it was a fascinating way to look at the situation, kind of give us some insight into how they're trying to, to make sure that they keep him sharp and also correct any of the accuracy problems he's had uh, his first two seasons at K-State. Yeah, it, uh, Chris Kleiman is basically like the baseball version of like the analytics people now. He's mm-hmm. just looking at being credit to him. Usually coaches at his, at his stage of the career are totally against that stuff, but he continues to evolve and become a new age coach. And that's why he's successful. That's why he's a Big 12 champion. He might... He made the joke earlier this year, and I, I wrote a story on it. How someone asked him how he's evolved as a coach. He's like, "Well, I'm older, grayer, and balder." Uh, you know, that's funny. I, I like that he's able to be modest and and kind of you know make jokes at himself, crack jokes at himself. But really, it's his ability to stay modern and stay young because you know older coaches, those guys of of that generation, sometimes have a big stubbornness to do so. Instead, he, he removed his best friend from the coaching staff. Yeah, he, he changed his entire offensive philosophy and put Colin Klein as the offensive coordinator, defensive guru. But he changed up his entire defense to run the three-three-five. Uh, hired like the new age offensive guys like Matthew Middleton and Brian Lep- Brian Lepac. I mean, he's done everything to kind of of what young coaches typically do. So uh, uh, just a modern mind that Chris Kleiman has become, and he's kind of doing that with the kicking thing now. Maybe he looked at it last year and they, they assessed it and was like, you know, some of Chris Tennant's failures were on us as a staff and the way that we approached it and, and and managed him throughout a year. So we'll see if those, you know, the alterations are maybe the difference. I would imagine the difference is Chris Tennant just growing up a little bit, being able to handle the moment a little bit better and still has a little bit more proof. 51 yard field goal is really not my concern with him. I, I think he probably has a, the weird thing with Chris Tennant is his percentage of field goals, probably 47 yards or more. It's probably greater than the no, it's 47 yards or less. So um, we'll see what those 
change-ups and curveballs than those 30 to 45-yard field goals. We'll see how he does against with those before I totally spike the football and say I'm the best uh, reporter in the world. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it'll be uh, it'll be good to see kind of how it, it, it plays out and where things move on. But I, I do think it's been it's a good start week one. Probably, yeah. yeah, yeah, probably probably have some more kicking opportunities this week against Troy. They'll maybe stiffen up a little bit more than Semo would in, on drives that ended in touchdowns or something. So uh, I'll be fascinated to continue to watch that really throughout the entirety of the year. Like Chris Tennant this year to me is last year's version of Will Howard, where the first game was, holy crap, like this is a totally different guy. This is really fun. But then the next game came, you're like, okay, when's he going to throw three interceptions or, you know, hand a fumble to Oklahoma State to take it 95 yards, you know, the other way and in this game or all this other stuff. You're just always waiting for the shoe to drop. And it never did for Will Howard. And he just proved, hey, I'm that guy now. Kind of the same deal with Chris Tennant where game one was awesome. He looked confident. He looked good. And honestly, hitting the, the PATs was a bigger deal to me than hitting the 51-yarder. Um, now we just wait and see, and it'll probably take a handful of games of consistency from him for me to just think that he he's fixed and he's put everything behind him, but it was a positive start to, uh, the season for Chris Tennant. And he certainly is looking like the kicker that, uh, he, he could be with all the talent and power that's in his leg. It's funny to me, like uh, Chris Kleiman was so adamant and insistent on playing so many players on Saturday, but even like, I think the last PAT had Leighton Simmering kick it. Mm-hmm. Well, you got to get everybody those reps. Never know what's going to happen. Uh, moving on, and another Chris Kleiman heavy topic here. Obviously, that makes sense. We're you know kind of recapping what he said yesterday, but this is important because this is a, a spot that Chris Kleiman's teams have struggled in at K State. They have lost three games to group of five members, once in a bowl game to Navy, and then two times early in the season to Arkansas State, and then last year to Tulane. Now, Tulane turned out to be a top 10 team beat USC in the Cotton Bowl, all this stuff, but still a game last year that K-State should have won at home probably. And Chris Kleiman, I, th- I felt like he kind of downplayed the G5 losses and acted like maybe there was no connection there. And it was just more about the team and how that they needed to operate and taking care of themselves. But it does seem like something is up here, why they've struggled in these games, especially when you look at it and see that They've dominated the FCS opponents. They've not played with their food in those games, except for one year when you know uh, Skylar Thompson got hurt and Will Howard had to step in uh, for for the rest of the game. What did you make of how Chris Kleiman handled addressing some of the questions about the G five losses yesterday? And then also, I know that the players talked about it some too. And and what vibe did you get from them? Yeah, I, well, I think the players it sounded like were admitting that they just didn't take. Tulane serious enough last year because they were high and mighty about two and zero and kicking Missouri's ass, so to speak. Yeah. Part of my and part of my language again. I just don't think Chris Kleiman gave a shit. <laughs> like I think he's like, we just won the Big Twelve. Like I'm not going to mm-hmm. like oc- let my mind occupy about this stupid Group of Five thing. We'll just go beat them next week, and no one will have to talk about it again. I think that's just the way he approaches things. That's his mindset. That's his personality. I th- and plus, I don't think he sees it as a trend, uh, right or wrong. And it's true. It might not be like it sounds a lot like excuses, and it could be. But if you lose to Troy, it's no longer time to make excuses. It, it, it is a trend, but you can't explain away um, those losses. I mean, playing it, it's your first year. You're in a bowl game against Navy. You're playing a military academy with a weird offense that mm-hmm. you have to – you know, prepare for, um, and you know, that's kind of funky. Uh, or 2020, you don't have to just point to Arkansas State, you could point to Iowa State that year, you can point to a few different games that season. Uh, for all intents and purposes, was maybe a leap off point for what they could learn from, but a disaster in terms of results. And it wasn't just the Arkansas State game. Um, just not sure that team was good enough to handle anything that was going to be thrown their way, and obviously, there was no consistency. Yeah. With how that that season progressed, I mean, you were playing safeties or linebackers at safety. You were going with three defense alignment at times for an, for a, for an away game. Just a, just a wreck of a year. And then last year, hey, Tulane's probably kind of good. They beat USC as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot could go into it. Were they excuses? Was is it a trend? Uh, we'll probably find out this week. My my 
spidey senses tell me this team has the maturity just to handle it the way that they're supposed to. And if not, then maybe there, there's some self-assessment that needs to happen. And I think that this team probably has the right balance right now of, I think it's good that Chris Kleiman says, Hey, I'm not panicking about this. And I understand like things happen in, in the game of football we're just going to go out and take care of, care of ourselves. And I think that's good for the coach to look at it that way and not himself be like, we can't lose to another one of these group of five schools again. Because like, yeah. I think that there would be some coaches that are like that, like probably more of the coaches that are more out you know, for themselves in this entire process. And it's like, hey, I'm not having another G5 loss on my resume. Like, we're not doing this. Like, I, I like Lane Kiffin, but – Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin are going to New Orleans to face Tulane this weekend. That feels like one of those where Lane Kiffin might be the guy saying, there's no way that we're taking the Lane train to, to New Orleans and losing to Tulane. We're just not doing it. Um, whereas I think Chris Kleiman playing it this way is good. And then it's a good thing that the players have their own accountability to be like, yeah, we've kind of messed up here. And I think they have their own motivation to not slip up in this game this weekend which is the right balance of my eyes. Let the coach do the coach stuff, but not try and you know put too much on his players and kind of put them down in some ways. And let the players be the ones to feel like crap and, and say the only way we can fix this problem is by helping ourselves out and going out and taking care of business because I just think that's what you got to do. I, I would compare it to the, to the parent-child relationship. Like, yes, I would mess up at times when I was younger and my dad could have seriously disciplined me or gotten on me about something. But at the end of the day, he, I knew that I did something wrong and I needed to make up for it. Like, I felt just as bad about it as he did. And the only way that I was really going to get over that hump is when I decided that I was going to fix the problem. So I think that's the position K-State's in right now. And I think that's a good thing. That's uh, that's what a new dad would say. <laughs> yeah, they go, yeah, Right on cue, right on brand. I think their tentacles are up. I do. I, I think of the players the, and the answers that it, at least I heard on – Tuesday, I think their tentacles are up. I, I don't think that they're going to, you know, fall into the same trap. Yeah, it certainly seems like uh, they're on the right path there. Uh, final final serious topic. We'll, we'll kind of throw this out there and uh, just kind of see the, the thoughts on it. But the defensive line played, I think, fairly well on Saturday against SEMO. Obviously, there are a lot of questions all around on the defensive line mainly at nose guard because Eli Huggins, who had been just a rock star for you and been so good, was gone. So how are you going to kind of plug things up there? How is everything going to work out with Uso Sayamalo's injury? And then on the edge, obviously, Felix DK Uzama is gone, and you're kind of looking for some guys to step up there. Um, what did you make of the defensive lines play, and what do you expect to, to kind of see them improve upon this coming week, it could be as simple as just, you know, more reps for Uso Sayamalo because I think everybody else was pretty solid last week. Yeah, more reps for Uso. That's probably the, yeah, the one thing you might want to look for more of. Um, but I'll, I love the defensive line on Saturday. I thought Javon Banks was really good, a lot of nice twitch. Damian Eli Leo literally wrecked the game in the first quarter, had a sack of his own, I believe. Uso Sayamalo had a mm-hmm. sack and was good in his 11 snaps. Chris Klein said Uso Sayamalo was the tackle of the game. He said Brendan Mott was the D end of the game and and won every rep. So shout out to Brendan Mott. Probably didn't put enough spotlight on him throughout all of our post-game stuff so far. And and maybe we didn't see uh, some of the stuff that Chris Kleiman is. He's he's an expert after all. If we we knew football the same way he did, uh, we'd probably be making millions of dollars as well on Saturdays. But hence we're not. We're behind a microphone and talking to each other at – on a Wednesday at 11.02 <laughs> a.m. So Chris Kleiman isn't having to do that. Uh, so anyway, yeah, Brennan Mott, really good game. Klee Duke really got after the, the quarterback. That's something he'll be able to do uh, throughout this year. Nate Matlack, a few splash plays as well. So everything you'd like from the defensive line. But, uh, you know, Chris Kleiman really, really liked what he saw from Brendan Mott and Uso Sayamala. All right, closing it out. Speaking of things that were like from the defensive line, and who's to say them all? Chris Kleiman was asked about the celebrations uh, that were busted out. Obviously, I think the one that probably got the most run on social media was uh, Will Howard shotgunning an imaginary beer. Um, with Hayden Gillum. With yeah. Hayden Gillum, a very good one. I would say probably very on brand for those two guys. Um, they seem like two guys that could probably uh, 
you know, Soccer do that too. a couple times after a game. Um, but Uso, he was a, a guy that had one stick out. So here we've got right here two of the, the better ones because Chris Kleiman mentioned Khalid Duke specifically. This is the Uso Sayamala one. If you're watching on the YouTube, you can see the video right now. Um, this is the play as it kind of develops and Uso gets in there and makes a sack and gets up, uh, maybe having to stumble over some guys, but gets out. And I don't know what we would call this, but he just stops in the middle of the field and does a little shimmy. Uh, and then obviously his teammates loved it because he hits them with the point afterwards. So very funny there. But the one that Chris Kleiman shouted out and mentioned specifically was this one from Khalid Duke, which I thought was the best that I noticed in game because he gets the sack and comes in there and immediately starts uh, casting the the reel and then pulling in the big fish. Uh, what did you make of the K-State celebrations on Saturday? And uh, which one was your favorite, D.Y.? Yeah, it was like uh, kind of a celebration day. I think RJ Garcia did the Cristiano Ronaldo one after his touchdown as well. Um, he shot out Ronaldo during his Tuesday uh, meeting with the media as well because that's his first name, so that's why he wanted to do it. Yeah, I, yeah hey, I like it. They're having fun. They're having a blast. Uh, didn't anticipate uh, Saturday being full of celebrations. Uh, like that that's not really like the Kansas State demo but I hope yeah. it is this year because I'm all up for it so keep doing that and give us more content to discuss I guess Chris Kleiman loved the Khalid Duke one. Oh, I wouldn't say he loved it it was the only one that he was aware of so that's why when he was asked that's the one he pointed out I wasn't even aware of the Khalid Duke one I you know it's it's hard not to like the shot gunning beers ones because I mean that's pretty novel. The uh, prop they, comedy is is pretty good on those, you know. Yeah, yeah. They they said that they saw Kenny Pickett did it one time, so they were kind of uh, duplicating his effort in in that department as well. Um, I do wonder what the coaching staff kind of thinks when you got your starting quarterback pretending he's uh, shotgunning a beer. But <laughs> well, we'll well, yeah, I, I, I'm I mean, sure. I I, I'm I, th sure. I I think uh, I think it was Cooper Beebe he, when the, someone asked him about it. I think even though he wasn't involved in the shotgun, shotgunning a beer celebration. I think he mentioned like Colin Klein was a little like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that doesn't really surprise me. Um, but the one thing I would say is I'm with you. I would love more of these celebrations throughout the year because they are funny. And it's a team now that like, they're the reigning big 12 champs. So there's some swagger there. Like they're going to own it. Like they're, they're not afraid to kind of peacock when things are going good for them. And I think that's fine. The only thing now, if you get the kind of the, the tag as being the celebratory team, might need to watch out. There may be some flags that get tossed because I have seen flags thrown for much lesser celebrations in K-State history uh, than what was busted out this weekend. I, Adrian oh. Martinez almost got one last year for the bow at Oklahoma. He said after the game that the ref came up and was like, never again. Um, but obviously the ones that immediately that just come to my head, because I was right there and I got footage of it too. Josh Youngblood got flagged for uh, dancing after taking a kickback against Texas Tech in 2019. Um, it was a very reserved dance and whatever. Uh, and then obviously the one that everybody remembers is Adrian Hilburn in the pinstripe bowl for the salute. So just that's the one thing to watch out for is do we get an excessive celebration penalty on the Wildcats this weekend or sometime in the near future? Uh, if you have something to celebrate, though, it's typically a good thing. <laughs> true, true. All right, any uh, closing thoughts before we uh, we get out of this edition of the KSO Show and tell everybody to, to go to K-State Online, get keeping up with the Cats, and then also come right back here uh, on Friday for the, uh, the game preview pod that we will do. Yeah, I was going to say Friday preview. I'll be out in the morning. And maybe some basketball recruiting content mm -hmm. coming. There might hmm. be something something in the water in Manhattan. Okay, well, that's exciting. It's always good when something's in the water, uh, <laughs> unless it's, I don't know, maybe the like chemicals in South Wichita that make the entire part of the city smell like crap. Uh, that's I I don't I don't live in South Wichita. Yeah, so man, <laughs> I just know enough about the people down there that like I guess for years something's I don't know. It's a big deal. There's trains involved and wild stuff. Uh, above my pay grade to fully discuss but i just know that it stinks down there and there there's concerns about the water supply so that'll do it for us uh for Derek young i'm mason both follow along with everything we got going on at k-state online as well as our boy drew galloway and uh, drew will be back 
on the Sunday show with myself and KSU fan. But that's right. Friday action here on the KSO YouTube and podcast platforms as DY and I preview the game with Troy. And uh, yes, good reminder. Keep an eye out on basketball. That really good basketball team and program still exists. And like, subscribe, and comment on all of our videos if you are so inclined to do so. It'll help us out. Any disparaging remarks? Depends. If they're about DY, keep them to yourself. If they're about me, throw them my way. Well, I can I can take it. I'm a man. I'm 25. All right. That'll do it for us. We're out of here. Until next time.